listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, you're listening to Pet Life Radio, and this is Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, your host, Deborah Wolf. And I just noticed that back in 2009, almost the same date as today, the same date as today, was my first ever show with Dr. Stanley Corin as my guest. It's been a long time. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Corin. Am I that old? <laughs> well. No, because I'm really young, so yeah, you know, I've matured as we yeah. did the show. Well, we've been be on the here. radio many times. We've been on this network many times, talking about dogs usually, sometimes cats, sometimes other animals. But today I invited you to join me, and for those listening for the first time, Dr. Corin writes many books. Professor Stanley Corin from UBC Psychology writes many, many books, including The Intelligence of Dogs, and I'll surely let him plug his latest one when we get to that. But today I'm talking to you because I saw you on TV, and I saw you talking about the human-animal bond the dog dog owner bond that they're kind of delving into with some science in Japan and something about chemicals being released in the human and the dog when they make eye contact. So I thought I'd better have you on and find out what the scoop is. So can you do that for us today, Dr. Corin? Sure. This is um, a study which comes out of Japan, mm-hmm. and it's really tracking down a set of studies which really started back in the 1980s and where a group of researchers were able to show that when we pet a familiar and friendly dog, our breathing becomes more regular, our heart beat slows, blood pressure goes down, and later studies showed that uh, the stress chemicals, hormones uh, like uh, the cortisol, tend to reduce. Anyway, what people have been asking is, this response, which we have, and by the way, dogs have exactly the same response when, we, when we're petting them. See, uh, I think it, that's cool, that it's mutual. I didn't realize, I knew the research said that humans have the feel-good hormone in their blood whenever they pet their pet, but I didn't know that the dogs felt it too. That's, that's nice. Right. That's right. And uh, one of the nice things about this, anyway, so people have been asking the question, okay, is this something special about, you know, dogs and uh, their relationship to us? And what this new research is doing is they're basically exploring this bond that we have with, with dogs. And they're asking, is this built in to the physiology of the dog? Have dogs sort of evolved to, uh, to have this response? And what they're using is they're using a uh, hormone, a measuring a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin has been called by some people sort of a love hormone. It shows up when we're engaged in affectionate uh, interactions, romantic love kind of thing, and also when when mothers are caring for their kids and and that kind of thing. And we've been able to show that, in fact, in species that that have lots of oxytocin, the bonding, sort of pair bonding, is much greater. Anyway, what these researchers did is, first of all, they asked the question, what does it take to get this oxytocin into our system when we're around a dog? And it turns out that all we have to do is to look into a dog's eyes. And that gaze, that sort of mutual gaze which we have, tends to release oxytocin in us, and it also tends to release oxytocin in the dogs. So just sort of looking into the eyes of, in this case, a loved one, I suppose, uh, releases this uh, hormone. Now, here's the neat part, okay? They now are going to extend the question, and they're going to say, is this something special about dogs? So what they did was they looked at wolves. And these are wolves which have been reared in human households and in close proximity to humans since they were puppies. And so now they measure this oxytocin, and when we gaze at a wolf, uh, or the wolf gazes at us, at us. And the bottom line is the wolf feels nothing, okay? The wolf does not... Really? Okay, so you're talking about wolves that live like pets with people. That's and, right. I, oh, and my goodness. The, See, I had a wolf cross. Would he qualify? 
years and years ago. I'm sure he felt it. I remember testing him to see if he could. My roommate stood across the room from me, and she signaled me without making a noise, without him seeing her. And when she signaled me, I would think loving, happy thoughts, and he'd start moaning. And when she signaled me to stop, I'd stop the loving, happy thoughts, and he'd stop moaning. Now, it wasn't eye contact which I think is adversarial in a lot of breeds. So that could go to some of the explanation. But I know he had the the feeling good empathy flowing back and forth between us. Are you saying that these wolves didn't or just the eye contact part of it? No, they didn't. Okay. And and that's the neat part. I mean, it's probably the dog in that wolf dog cross, which is conveying these responses. And, and, And here's the neat thing. Okay. You know, scientists have a whole bunch of sexy words which we use to describe uh, what's going on between dogs and and humans. And one of the words which pops up is something called coevolution. And coevolution simply means that over time, since we started domesticating dogs, dogs have changed, and they've changed physiologically and genetically, so that they fit in better with our lives. And the guess is that we've changed so that, in fact, dogs fit in better uh, with us. Now, how could that sort of thing happen? Well, it was not deliberate, okay? This is sort of of seat-of-the-pants kinds of applied genetics. Way back when we started to domesticate dogs, we've probably encountered some dogs which were a lot more pleasant, which had a bond with us, which were much more affectionate and that sort of thing. Well, consider the fact If we have some dogs who are very affectionate and seem to be very responsive to us and others which don't, then which ones are going to get the best care, which ones are we most likely to breed, and so forth? Well, you know, we're going to lean toward the dogs which seem to have the best responses to us, and we're probably going to breed them with other dogs which also have better responses to us. So over time, what we've been doing is sort of genetically manipulating the dogs so that, in fact, they are becoming um, much more likely to have a bond with us. And in that way, they're also, you know, fitting in with our psychology because, you know, we're changing as a species, but the dogs are also changing as a species, and they're changing in a way which has their psychology converge with us. So that's a neat Well, what point. do you mean we're changing? How are humans well, changing in this explanation? I, well, I get just, why the dog changes. We pick the nicest, sweetest, friendliest to humans, and those ones we breed like crazy, the ones who are more aloof or aggressive don't get bred. Okay, but how are we changing ourselves? Well... Early on, the changes would be, would have been much greater because early on we were leaning on dogs much more as work partners, as in herding, or combat partners, as in war dogs, and that sort of thing. Oh, uh, so so dog skills and dog compatibility in humans was also a survival factor. Exactly. If you were good with yeah. dogs, or your tribe was, or your pack was, then you were going to survive. And if you had a chief or a leader or whatever who said no dogs, because we're talking primitive times, aren't we? How long right, ago yeah. is this? This oh, isn't well. recent, is it? No, 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 no. <laughs> We've been fiddling with dogs. We probably domesticated them about 14,000 years ago, maybe if we believe the, the latest data coming out of Russia and, and uh, Southern Asia, uh, maybe 17,000 years. But, you know, so we've been fiddling with dogs for a long time. As I said, you know, early on, they were, you know, a, a vital survival thing. I mean, you know, they were guards and they would defend the village and, you know, and help us hunt and do all that sort of other neatsy keen stuff. Well, I still think if people had to rely on their animals, truly rely on them, you know, if we didn't have cars, if they needed horses, if we didn't have all the mechanics, and we, people would treat them well because, oh, yeah. be, you know, yeah. it would be different, wouldn't it? Well, and, and in fact, you know, if we move outside of the big cities, I mean, dogs really still have jobs. <laughs> you know, it's in the, in the well, city. Well, you know what? I want to talk to you about that as it relates to this. So the eye contact thing, you know, whether you got a city dog or a country dog, I don't think is as determinant about whether your dog's going to seek out eye contact as is the breed sometimes no. or the history. Some dogs, you know, they've been beat up. They're not going to look at you in the face. They're going to think that's a challenge. And there are dogs like my Roddy Cross that I rescued. For a long time, I caught him looking in mirrors 
making eye contact with me through a mirror because he didn't want to challenge me directly, but he really wanted to know what I was up to. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you get these weird variations. But so if someone's out there listening and they think, "Oh, I really want to make eye contact with my dog," but every time I do it, she wets herself or he thinks he's in trouble or he cowers, what would you advise them? How can they get Watch that dog? Eyes. You Watch know, their, connecting at the same time. Okay, I mean, that's the real trick. I mean, Ian Dunbar, who's, you know, mm-hmm. the daddy of sort of puppy classes and of lure training and a whole bunch of other neat stuff, has a really neat trick, okay? And it's part of socializing your dogs. What you do is when you're going to go give your dog a treat, you do mm-hmm. three things, okay? Not only do you have give them the treat, but you touch their collar and make eye contact, okay? And what that does is it does two things. It makes both the touch, your touch, and that eye contact, a positive thing. You know, no, it might not be the case that, you know, everybody making eye contact with the dog is going to have produced the same positive response in that dog, but, it, but certainly it will for you. It's much the same way that dogs learn, you know, when things are a threat and when they're not. And so in order to be a threat, that gaze has to be direct, wide-eyed gaze for a prolonged period of time. But the kind of casual gaze, which we're talking about here, is different. You know, you mentioned Ian Dunbar. Sometimes very <laughs> difficult for the interviewer, i got to tell you. But it's always good. We're going to take a little break there, Dr. Corin. You know, I'm so used to calling you other things, like Stan. And, <laughs> and it's difficult to call you Dr. Corin, Professor Corin on air. It makes me feel like a little kid in school, which uh, would be nice. I'd like to be a college kid in school right about now but we're going to come back on uh, Animal Party Pet Life Radio and talk more about some of the breed differences and how this applies we sort of mentioned wolves and teaching a dog who's shy because of experience or breed how to make the eye contact but I think I'd like to explore the breed differences a little more and I've got some other questions about other animal people bond dog bond with other creatures so stay tuned we'll be back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio this is Deborah Wolf stay don't leave this party before it's over because the best is yet to come. Only losers leave the party early anyway. Party on. Back in a few. Tired of wasting money on giant boxes of litter that don't work and don't last? Switch to World's Best Cat Litter, the only litter with concentrated power. So even a small bag lasts one cat 30 days. Outstanding odor control, quick clumping, lightweight. It's even flushable. World's best cat litter. Everything else is just litter. Find it near you at www.itsnotjustlitter.com. That's www.itsnotjustlitter.com. Active for Pets is a new wellness platform and app that helps pet parents save time and money on their vet bills. Stop paying for unnecessary vet treatments. Consult with a vet online. Get unlimited access to your pet's entire health history from any computer or smartphone with the Active for Pets app. Vaccinations, medications, test results, and more. Active 4 Pets gives you access to a team of expert vets for non-emergency care. Make an appointment before, during, or after office hours. Skip the waiting room and get a secure online vet consult on your schedule. Taking care of your pets is as easy as it gets with Active 4 Pets. Ready to try Active 4 Pets? Listeners get 40% off a one-year membership. To get this great offer, use promo code PETLIFE on the sign-up page of Active4Pets.com. That's A-C-T-I-V, the number 4, P-E-T-S dot com. Or call 888-512-2848. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Pet you're, you're, you're inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go. Hello. You're back on Animal Party. Glad you could make it to the party. Hope you got your party clothes on. We're here with Dr. Stan Corin, Professor Corin, and uh, we're talking on Pet Life Radio. We're talking about the animal-human bond. When you look at your pet, you get oxytocin and flowing through your blood and him too, her too. This is that. It's the stuff that when you're giving birth to a little baby human, when you think you just can't stand it anymore, all of a sudden it kind of feels not so bad. And then it happens all over again. But that's that stuff, the magic, that magic stuff. 
And I'm just wondering, um, Dr. Korn, before we get on to the other breeds, can I ask you, what happens if the person is not the dog owner? Do they still, you know, like in Japan, they have these go rent a cat for, rent a dog for the lunch hour, go to the cat cafe and pet a cat for the half hour. This is where they're doing all these studies. Do they test what happens with strangers and animals? Does it still work? Yep, it still works. Uh, oh, again, hospital it, people, yeah. Well, again, you know, you can't do this sort of prolonged, wide-eyed stare. That's a threat, okay? But this sort of casual, you know, gazing into the dog's eyes, that seems to be the trigger. You know, we look at the dog and we go, oh, look at those little spaniel eyes. They're so good. <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so forth. so biased. And, you know, <laughs> so, yes, it works. Dogs seem to be tuned to us as a species. And it doesn't just work with spaniels. No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm saying that because you right don't now have I'm like, to run out and get a spaniel just because <laughs> Dr. Corin has one. He's had other dogs. I know because when I first met you and we used to watch each other's booths so we could take our dogs for little breaks at book fairs and things. I think it, I think it was a lab. Was it a lab back then? Oh, Some no, kind of retriever, was, Chesapeake Bay, maybe. It was, a, it was a flat-coated retriever. Flat-coated. Okay, oh, it's a long yeah. time ago. Nineties, yeah. I think it was back then. Yeah, yeah, it was a flat-coated. Now, well, of course you know. <laughs> you <remember. laughs> I hope I know. <laughs> you know, when the producer told me about the show 2009, April 21, I realized right away, as soon as I saw the date, I realized that when we did that show, I had no idea that a few weeks later, my blue healer was going to pass away on me and, you know, have heart attack problems and just die really suddenly. I'd had her for 12 years as a rescue. And then uh, I've not had a blue healer in my life since then until about two weeks ago. And it's just really interesting that I have always, it's like, it's just seeing this familiar, uh, it just feels so right. And, you know, I was talking to someone on air the other day, and uh, they were talking about how they had a three-legged dog. And now when that dog died, they couldn't ever have a four-legged dog again. They would always look to rescue a three-legged dog. And I just thought, well, that's amazing. What a good person. Okay, so we're on breeds. And I know you're the breed guy. You wrote The Intelligence of Dogs. You know all about the different breeds. Different breeds. There are some breeds like Golden Retrievers that are always looking in your eyes with love. And then there are other breeds like Rotties. They look, look away, look, look away, look, look away. They're always looking for instructions. Dobies, too. But how much does this play into this whole thing? Well, it plays into it quite a bit. I mean, you know, we were talking about Spaniels before, okay? And let me give you the example, okay? Do you, do you know where the name Spaniel comes from? Well, the Span in Spaniel comes from Spain, okay? It's Espanol, okay? And, you know, dogs are usually named either after the person who, who created the breed, so that we have a Jack Russell Terrier and that sort of thing, or the place where the dog was created, such as, you know, the English Bulldog and that kind of thing. So you would guess on the basis of the name that, in fact, Spaniels were developed in Spain. Well, it turns out that no Spaniel was ever developed in Spain. So why do we have these dogs named Spaniels? Well, the reason is that when the first of the Spaniel breeds were being developed, it was believed that the best lovers in the world came from Spain. And now you have these kissy-faced dogs. So, you know, regardless of the reality of the situations, they must have a Spanish connection. So that's how we ended up with Spaniels. And if you will, it's just people sort of responding to the fact that this set of breeds of dogs are just much more sociable and kissy-faced. And that's the way it is for certain breeds. I mean, a lot of our companion dogs, the uh, toy dogs, are specifically bred so that they, in fact, are sucky and kissy-faced dogs and respond to our particular emotional responses. And even within lines of dogs, you can have differences. So, for example, most of the retrievers are really, you know, I mean, they're like the Spaniels, okay? You know, they, their motto is, you got a face, I got a tongue, we can work something else. <laughs> and, but, uh, but, you know what but, I tell people? Get into a kissing contest with your golden, and I dare you, just see, you know, plant just a normal kiss on its cheek and see if you can have the last kiss, like the last <laughs> one. Just see, because I guarantee you, you will not. She'll kiss you back, she'll kiss you back, she'll kiss you back. And she will understand that this is a game. She will totally dig this game. Just, you know, wash up after. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Now, 
Now, it really holds for almost all of the retrievers, okay? All the retrievers are really these sort of, you know, incredibly sociable dogs, except for the Chesapeake Bay Retriever. And the Mm -hmm. Chesapeake Bay Retriever was specifically bred not just to be a retriever and to work with us very closely, but when the hunters would shoot down the ducks, you know, in the bay, uh, the dogs would retrieve them, and then they'd put them in little carts. And so the other job that the dogs had was to guard the cart, And, of course, that means that they have to be suspicious of anybody they don't know well. So, in fact... Yeah, it makes uh, sense. It's all about function and breeding. That's right. So, we bred that into, if you will, for some dogs, we breed in this sort of bonding. And for other dogs, the guard dogs, we tend to breed out the bonding. And then there's the visual dogs. Like I find sometimes, even this new blue healer I have, when I work with Border Collies, which is so fun. Oh my gosh, you've been on so many times, Dr. Corn. I just see episodes 3, 4, 40, 41, and 65. If anyone wants to hear me and Dr. Corn after we finish this show, we have been on air a whole bunch of times on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. I call you every time there's something to do with psychology and the way animals think. And it's so nice you come on the show so much. That's just great. 3, 4, 40, 41, and 65. So um, I was saying, though, that uh, the eye contact, with these dogs that are meant to herd, they're very visual, I find. And it might be because they're making eye contact with the guy on the horse a far distance away. I don't know. Or maybe they're making eye contact with the sheep. Is this an interspecies thing, too? Because these border collies and blue healers and like dogs, they don't take their eyes off you. They're always ready for the next instruction and the next look. It's well, like telepathy. Yeah, I- Yeah, I mean, they are very, very attuned to sort of our behaviors, and they're watching. They're not looking for eye contact with us because they they actually use the eye contact to move sheep, for example, and they they stare at them. It's it's called you know it's called a hard gaze, and the sheep look at that and go, oh my god, (laughs) and they and they freeze. (laughs) <laughs> and they freeze in place. So so they're using that as a utility kind of a thing. You know, most of the herding dogs, like most of the retrievers, were specifically bred to work in very close association with us. So one of the things which we seem to have bred into these dogs is attention. And they tend to sort of monitor our movements and and try to figure out what it is which we're doing next because it affects their behavior. And that's one of the, the, the reasons why, you know, there's some people who feel that certain breeds of dogs, usually the retrievers in this case, but sometimes some of the other dogs, you know, some people feel that they have ESP. And the reason is that these dogs are watching us so well that when we come in and our body posture changes, and it does, when we're depressed, we tend to sort of fold in on ourselves. When we're very high and happy, you know, we tend to be much bouncier and that kind of thing. And so the dog then reads our behavior and responds in, in some sort of, you know, empathic way. So you don't think it's telepathy when you no, no. go to catch your cat to take it to the vet and it hides, even though it never hides from you. You think you are giving off a cue, even though you try not to really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's I, like, I, what do they I, call I, those things you move around on, those they, that you stand on them and they move because it knows what you're thinking, but it's really your motion? You know those oh, things? Yeah, sort of the virtual reality kinds of things, yeah. Um, no, the thing in the city, it's uh, like a scooter, except, oh, I can't. Oh, the, oh, the two-wheeled scooter. <laughs> yes, it's like that, because you see these guys flying along and you think, hot. It, you hardly, but he, the slightest twitch and it turns. That's, you know, it's that, yeah. it, and I guess that's what it's like. Yeah, and but you know, dogs really have developed this very fine sensitivity to any kind of nonverbal communication. I mean, if you think back at the origin of dogs, that makes sense because you know, suppose you suppose we have sort of the proto dog, you know, wolves or whatever else, and they're pack hunters, right? Well, if the leader of the pack yells to the other animals in the pack, "Hey, guys, look, there's a deer over there," well, guess what? They've just lost lunch because the deer here. It too. So, right. in fact, they have developed a very fine, sensitive kind of ability to read body language. And that, you know, and if you look at some of the service dogs, you know, especially the handicapped assistance dogs and those sorts of things, they, in fact, you know, read your intention before you say your intention, you know, and so they'll catch your gaze and then look in the direction you're gazing. 
Well, you know what, though? I don't know. I think I have to argue this one. Like, when I'm driving home and it's like clockwork, if I stop in at a neighbor anywhere near here or the Boy Scout Hall, which I often go to, or the school, which I'm often at, any of the places that are within 20-minute range of my home, my red standard poodle female goes bananas. Whoever's at home knows I'm nearby. If I go away on a plane and I land in Vancouver, before the plane even lands, my stud standard poodle poodle starts going cuckoo like really cuckoo you know it's every single time and no, I'm not here to give them any cues and neither is the person minding my house or or my kids who aren't even paying attention to the fact that I nipped out to the neighbors you know like it's got to be psychic <laughs> well I'll let you believe that it's psychic the the uh there has been some some actual research uh, yeah, in England. I, Remember that big study and all the dogs they thought could tell when their owners were coming home? It's like 80% that, really that, could. That, yeah, yeah so. that, that, was, that was Sheldrake. And unfortunately, you know, when the dogs, which he claimed had this sort of psychic ability, were actually tested systematically by a, a psychologist in the UK, you know, he did not find any evidence for that. And okay, you know what? Right here, right now, I'm volunteering my two poodles. You want to test them for this? <laughs> I'm game. Totally, totally game right now. And I know they're gifted. I know standard poodles are bright, but it doesn't matter. They are, you could totally, my mom had us, we had a standard poodle when I was growing up, and she used to ask us, she was waiting for my dad to come home, waiting for my dad to come home. And before cell phone, she would call him at work and he'd say, oh yeah, I'm on my way, I'm on my way. But he wasn't on his way. He'd do one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. So she'd wait until the dog went to the front door that's when she put the beans on she didn't do it till he went to the front door because he didn't want soggy beans and she would always ask us is the dog at the front door yet is the dog at the front door yet I remember this I'm not the only one maybe it's a standard poodle thing but I don't think so I well, think it's better <laughs> just, just, just you're dealing with the natural skepticism of a psychological scientist so what can I tell you <laughs> We are going to go to break on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. This is Deborah Wolf, and I'm your host as always. And I hope you got your party snacks. This is your chance to run to the refrigerator, get a drink, cold drink, get your dog some cold water. We'll be back soon with more Animal Party Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf. Don't go anywhere, because the best is yet to come. Stick around. Hi, Jill. I see you and Bella are enjoying this lovely day as well. It's a perfect day for a walk. Isn't that right, Bella? And what a colorful ID tag you have, Bella. It certainly puts my Rusty's boring engraved tag to shame. Isn't it great? It's a dog tag art tag. Dog tag art? Yeah. Dog tag art makes the world's coolest pet ID tags. Pick from hundreds of cute designs or upload your photos or artwork to create a unique tag of your own. They even give you four lines of text on the back of the tag for important contact information. I love it! But do they hold up? We have to replace Rusty's metal tags so often because the information wears away. Dog tag art tags are some of the highest quality pet tags out there. They're made with super durable stainless steel. Your information is always legible and the tags are guaranteed for life. Well, I'm sold. Where can I get my dog tag art tag for Rusty? Dogtagart.com. Shopping there is so easy and fun. You're sure to find one that matches Rusty's personality perfectly. Sounds great. We can't wait to get online and get a tag of our own. Dogtagart.com. We keep best friends together. Use the coupon code RADIO for a 25% discount off any tag. Amazing Pet Expos is coming to a city near you. Admission is always free, and your pet is welcome. Shopping, adoptions, free nail trims, discounted shots and microchipping, agility, a pet costume contest, and much more. Plus, meet the guys from Animal Planet's hit TV series Tank and Pit Boss online at AmazingPetExpos.com. Bring your pets to the Pet Expo. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com 
Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hello! Welcome back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Hope your dogs, your cats, yourselves, I hope you're all comfortable because we're ready to talk to Dr. Corin once again on Animal Party Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf, your host. Welcome back. You find me the study and I will bring them over. They're very social, well trained, they'll behave themselves. I'll drive away and come back and you see what happens. It might be just near home though. It might have to do with something I don't know. I don't know. Well, I you know, for you a could, while you could wire it up here. I'd be happy with that. Uh, for a while for a long <laughs> while I used to think that my Karen Terrier had sort of this, this psychic ability because he had a Joni bark. With them for my wife Joan, so oh, yeah. when she was when she was on her way home, you know, he would give this Joni bark. Anyway, when she got rid of the old Mustang, which he had driven all these years, which in fact right. was a marvelously noisy little car, all of a sudden he lost his Joni anticipation bark. So, you know, so I think probably <laughs> so had something car. more to do with the with the sound of that car, and maybe he could, in fact, you know, anticipate it a block or two away. I had a border collie named Mitzi. She was a customer. When I met her, she was, they were about to give her up. They'd had her a few months, and she was about a year old, and she was just hurting their legs and tripping them when they tried to walk her and peeling the fur off their cats that she would catch and let go and catch and let go all day long. She was kind of a menace, and they were about to give her up, and I took her for our trial meet and greet, you know, what am I going to recommend lesson, and by the time I got about a block away, I said, okay, if I train this dog for you, can I use her in my shows? And they're looking at me like you're nuts I said yeah no really really she's going to train up so great and I knew you know anyway this dog was so attached to me she was just misguided had nothing to do needed way more exercise and way more direction she was so beautiful in in the show ring everywhere I took her just fantastic but um (laughs) but uh she escaped one time from her owner when her owner was well her owner used to tell me she knew whenever I was in the neighborhood whenever I passed by on first avenue in Vancouver they lived around Renfrew and third east third and she would always know when I was nearby but one time which was truly amazing was when my van had been busted up it was at the insurance place I was in their loaner van driving around. I was back at the insurance place doing a meeting about the van, surveying the damage. And who shows up? It's nowhere near her home. She's been visiting with her mom at some friend's house. Mitzi, in the parking lot at the insurance place, barking her head off. And I'm in a private room and I hear this barking. I'm like, that really sounds like Mitzi. I go out and sure enough, it's Mitzi standing beside the rental car. I don't know. I think they're psychic. Someone's going to have to prove me wrong on this one. And I'm totally willing, if anyone's listening who wants to run an experiment, I got two dogs who can tell when I'm coming home. I really do. So, so Dr. Korn, I want to ask you one more thing before we cut out, though. And that is, you know, if people and animal bond so well, Sometimes you hear, like recently, there was a kid in care who actually murdered another child, a girl in care, and it was said that previously this child in care who who was so violent had been violent against a pregnant dog and murdered her with a baseball bat and her unborn babies. And there seems to be this connection between violence in humans, lack of bonding with animals, and then lack of care toward other humans and violence against humans. And I I just want to know, like, what do you do if you see this, if you see your kid not connecting right or there's something because you're the one person who knows what to do what if because you can you can often spot this but it's never your kid what do you do if it is your kid who's maybe just not connecting and how do you know well the first thing you do is you give the kids some responsibility for the dog and the second thing you do is you start to hand feed the dog only you have the child hand feed the dog So what you're going to do here is it's a little game which you start to play, okay? The child has, I mean, all you have to do is teach the dog maybe three commands, you know, come, sit, down, okay, something like that. So the child is going to hand feed the dog one kibble at a time, but only if the dog responds to that particular command. So if you say, Lassie, come, kibble, Lassie, sit, kibble, Lassie, down, kibble, so on and so forth, okay? Now, you're saying to yourself, well, what does that have to do? What that is doing is that is building the bond between the child and the dog because the dog is paying attention to the child, is responding to what the child says, and is acting happy and sending all those signs. And the child has control over it. 
He does. So this would be supervised in the beginning, right? Oh yeah, in the beginning it would be it would be totally supervised. But after a while, I mean, that bond forms, and then you know, then your yes. problem is with when the child goes off to college. You know, how do you deal with the fact that they're going to be hurting so much when the dog's not there? But well, some you know, college campuses allow pets. Some participate in foster programs. There is some. It's usually more cats or small dogs, but it can be done. Uh, there are colleges who've opened up their dorms to pet owning students, so it's not always leave it behind with dad. But if you do have a kid that's a little bit older and you're thinking of getting a pet, you better make sure you like that pet because chances are they're leaving it behind when they go. That's really good advice for people. And if you're having trouble with the come or the down, I'm on YouTube with all the 10 most popular dog command uh, videos, all for free. And you can access them through my site, DebraWolfOnline.com. You can also go to Facebook, Camp Good Dog, to see all the happy puppies and dogs that are visiting, including a three-legged dog named Buddy who's here and the organization that is connecting all these people who own three-legged dogs is called tripods.com t-r-i-p-a-w-d-s dot com and I just wanted to give them a mention because if you've got I know Stan you've talked about this on the show before how a lot of times people get the wrong dog exercise wise if you've got this desire to have the smartest dog in the world the border collie or the super super fast beautiful and intense and hyper Jack Russell and you just don't think you're up to it you're probably right you're probably not up to it but you might be up to the three legged version so check out tripods.com so Stan I think we have to wrap up the show I know I'll have you back what book are you uh, uh, touring with right now? The two most recent books, the first one is uh, Do Dogs Dream? And the other one is called The Wisdom of Dogs. So those are the two new books which I have out. And hopefully in a short time, we will have another one out. So... <laughs> <laughs> wow. See, I am I say in a short time, I'm hopeful to have a litter of standard poodle puppies. That's coming in a month. But you, the- you have books <laughs> as often as I have puppies. It's crazy how many books you write. Do Dogs Dream and Wisdom of Dogs. And where can they get those books? I guess available right here at Pet Life Radio. There'll be a link. So that's probably the easiest way. And uh, uh, Do Dogs Dream. Well, Do Dogs Dream? I mean, they sure quiver and shake. I say yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, they definitely dream. But The Do Dog's Dream is an interesting book. It's really, uh, you know, over the years, there are questions which people are always asking about dogs. And there seem to be a set of them which always come up. And so what Do Dog's Dream is really about is it is a, a book which tries to answer all of those questions which people are always asking me, but to do it in a way so that you know, I always call it a cocktail party way, so that you have a nice, easy, quick answer to these questions. And, okay, you uh, know what, Dr. Gorn, I would love to have you back in the future, maybe next month. And um, if you could send me it, that would be really good. Then I can ask you my favorites. Okay. That would be great. Okay, well, stay tuned for that, listeners. That will be great. We'll have a party, another party, an animal party on Pet Life Radio. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Corin. Okay, you take care, Dr. Thank you. We'll talk in a month. That sounds great. Okay, everybody, until next time, from me, Deborah Wolf, you can find me at DebraWolfOnline.com. Until then, be good to your animals from Animal Party and Pet Life Radio and me. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.